see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Good morning and welcome to Artifact Live, where we look at the art and science of storytelling with me, Scott MacArthur. Episode 38, we're almost at 40. Um, does that mean I'm becoming a middle-aged vlogger? <laughs> uh, can't believe it's been going on for so long and equally I can't believe the response we've had over the last few weeks in, is in particular, it's been fantastic. So as always, uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, please pop your name and your location into the chat. If you're joining us from the Empathy Engine Facebook group, now Scott's just got to find it. I'll put this on the screen. There we are. Um, click on the little link that's in the Facebook group that you can see in the, on the screen just now, and that will make sure that your name uh, and your uh, location is quite clear in the chat. So I hope you, uh, well, from the feedback I've had, you enjoyed last week, uh, and so did I. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a real interesting conversation that you and Morrison and I had um, about um, the, the whole topic of storytelling and how one finds one's stories. And Ewan's real focus, um, and, and, and I've subsequently continued the conversation with Ewan, is about doing exactly what I say to everybody that we should be doing, as a Indiana Jones here does, where we should be archaeologists of our own life, going back and taking those things into the, the, the present and sharing those with our friends, family and colleagues. Um, it's been again interesting this week from that perspective because I told the very sad story of my friend Tom who died last week and whose grandfather made this, this violin. And really weirdly, um, just this morning, uh, my partner, Samantha, got an email from America um, about her parents and about a story that she didn't know about. Um, so these these stories are all round about us, uh, and I genuinely do think trying to capture them is critically important. And to remind you what I do, I'm not saying it would work for you, uh, I do two or three things. One, for uh, one of my great heroes, Tony Benn, the, the Labour Party uh, activist and politician, uh, was a great one for recording his his diary every day in an old uh, tape recorder with the two buttons he used to press down in the old microphone. Uh, and 30 years ago, I started to do the same thing, um, initially on the old dictaphone, but now on, on one of these gizmos. Um, and I think that has, well, I know that has proven to be incredibly useful for me throughout my, my career and um, when I started to become a professional speaker. And indeed, my guest today, Tony, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, um, I reminded myself of when I first met Tony uh, just by using my, my, my audio recording the other day. So that's the one thing I do. The second thing I do is, and, I, and this is really quite old fashioned, uh, I know, but I have, a, I have a spreadsheet on this laptop and um, I've basically got all the years since I was born on there. Then I have a row of events that happened in each of those years. Then underneath that, I've got my own little stories. Um, some of them are just one or two words, one or two lines, sorry. Some of them are significant parts of my life. And I find that linking it to an event not only triggers your memory about where you were, because the older you get, the, well, I find it the harder it is to remember, you know, when things actually happened or to get them muddled up. But if I say, you know, the year Lady Diana uh, died or the year, you know, Back in Black was number one in the charts or whatever. Any of these things helps me remember what where I was at any one point, and then I can try and remember my stories and write them down. So that's how I do it. It'll be really interesting to see how Tony Brassington does it today because Tony, who I'll bring on in a sec, um, the reason I asked him, there's two reasons. One is, um, well, I met him on the Red Dot uh, uh, in uh, uh, the TEDx Telford event, and 
I really was quite beguiled by his topic, and I'll ask Tony to talk about that. But uh, so that was the first thing. But the second thing is this guy, um, a bit like you in last week, is able to put his st story tendrils into all sorts of places. Um, the roots of his stories are, are across the domains, and that's actually quite unusual. Um, and I think the richness that that can bring, particularly to a storyteller, is, is well. It's fantastic. Oftentimes, I'm told you need to have a deeper niche. Well, I'm not sure about that. I, and maybe Tony and I can have a chat about that. But uh, so that's 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 the context of today. I hope you enjoy it. I'll just check the chat, see if anybody's new in at all. No, good morning, everybody. Thanks for saying good morning. No, nope, we're okay. Right, I'll get Tony on now. Right, Tony, I'm going to switch it on. There you go. You're on. Um. Oh no, that's not oh. working. There we go. You're on yeah. now. <laughs> good morning, Tony. <laughs> good morning, Scott. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much, much for coming. Great to be here. <laughs> yeah. Can you believe it's been a few years now since we met? Yeah. It's, uh, stage. By. Yeah. What's your memory of that day? Um. Well, I've done quite a bit of public speaking, so I, I thought um, it was just a, a very nice, enjoyable event. Yeah. The audience was a nice vibe and all yeah, that really. kind of thing. Yeah. Um. So many interesting talks, which is what makes tedx stand out so yes. many interesting characters yes yes and yeah interaction with the audience after the after your talk as well so it's uh, no it's all good it's all good so um tell tell my audience um what it is you you do what, what is your main focus of your activities tony what do you what do you do for a living etc um i'm in both worlds at the moment i am um a mechanical engineer in my day job and then i am very busy as an author uh i seem to be writing an increasing number of books year on year uh <laughs> which which is uh, amazes me you seem to be able, the more you write the easier it gets as you can imagine right um, <laughs> yeah and your day um, job you, you say you're a, you're an engineer uh what, what sort of engineering do you do sorry well i i repair forklift trucks right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah so actually <laughs> interestingly all of my life i've either yeah. i've either been repairing things or driving them right okay yeah but um about when i was about 40 eventually i got a bit fed up with listening to the radio and stuff as i was driving around and i started yeah. playing yeah. audio books uh -huh. and when i um, I stumbled across one almost quite by accident about goal setting and stuff. And I'd always fought big and set goals right since my teens. Yes. So I remember looking at this book thinking, well, what can this guy teach me? But luckily I was more open-minded and I tried it. And he really spoke my language and he got me looking at this whole area in a lot more detail. In no, um, no time at all, I had, you know, tens of these audio books, all the big names of the day, including a Zig Ziglar's and Brian Tracy and ah, right, okay. all the rest of them. So I've had a really good education as I've been driving around at the same time. Yes. And you also marry that up with the fact that I'm going driving to lots of different businesses. So you see how lots of people, um, how, they, how they earn their living, how they apply their trade. You see yeah. people succeeding and you see people failing. Yeah. You sometimes see a new manager come on site and you think, yeah, you've got about six months before this place shuts. You know, you, <laughs> you, you, you get um, you get quite a good perception. Yes, and I, I think that um, it takes time to to build up this wide collective knowledge, but stuff like that all feeds into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I'm very interested in your um, the way you've garnered and gathered your knowledge through the audiobook world because. Uh, that is, is significantly what I did as well, believe it or not. Uh, um, I mean, I did, a, I guess I did a bit more traditional university then went on to jobs. But then I think I was in my 30s when I discovered a, an online platform where you could, because I didn't have any money. So we used to have to get these books from the library or, yeah. or from online. And yeah. I've discovered this this platform, still use it occasionally, called Easy News, which is basically a news group trawler where you can just download all the books yeah. Um, and I did exactly the same because I was in consulting and I, I ended up traveling a lot and I always had these things in my ears 
Yeah. And it's amazing over the years how much you can get into your head, isn't it? That's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. So do you do you still do that, or have you moved on to something else, or do you still listen to books? Or I am. I yeah. I'm listening. Um, I've always I've, I've I've listened to a lot of the personal development stuff for probably yeah. a decade. And when the secret came out and and the law of attraction, I did a, a great deal of uh, listening to that and things like the strangest secret by Earl Nightingale. I could play it and play it and play it from the first time I heard it. I knew it was special. Yeah. And I, I, um, I was pleased to hear uh, Bob Proctor say that that's how he was when he first heard it. He played right. Earl Nightingale's the strangest secret just for years. Right. And I uh, think grow rich is another one. I mean, I won't say I know it word for word, but I've heard it enough times that I should do, <laughs> but, but you've also got to go wider than that you've also yeah. got to you've got to look at what a human being is and what our history is and things because as a species we don't really understand each other nobody can even give you an accurate um age for the human race yeah. yes um so things like uh, i think um many lives many masters by brian wise right that's a great one about past life experiences Joseph right. Campbell's um, all of his books looking at the history of religions. Yeah, yeah. So I think you've got to go quite a lot wider hmm. um, and get to, we, you know, we've got this strong spiritual thing within us, and it dictates a lot of what we do. We don't really understand where it comes from or what's pulling our strings. So mm -hmm. it's it's good to go as wide as you can with it. All mm -hmm. I think. So, given that, and given your background. Why on earth should anybody, you know, not just have the stories in their heads? Why should they start to write them down? You know, why write a book? You know, what, what, what should people be thinking about if they're thinking about writing a book? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there's four reasons for writing a book. Well, you might say there's there's three reasons and there's a fourth reason that stands on its own or can fit in with the other three. The first reason, um, they sometimes call it the vanity publishing, which is a bit of a harsh term perhaps, yeah. where you're writing a book just for yourself and for your family members and things. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can put whatever content in that you want. It's entirely for you. And yeah, and once you've done it, you've achieved something that so many people would never achieve. The second time of reason to write a book is for the, like the business card where you write this book, which is very much full of your content and what you want to put across, but it also considers the customer and what you can do for it, him or her. And that book needs to be fairly thick, you know, um, nice, nice gaps in the paragraphs and all that thing. So you use lots of pages. So when it hits the desk, it's got a nice FUD factor. And then the third reason is a commercial book, which um, it's, great writing from the heart but if you actually want to earn a living from books you need to study what you need to do to make your books work commercially and mm. the fourth reason is channeled where people sometimes get a book that's totally channeled it's almost like in a different voice to their own altogether and the content occasionally isn't even stuff they know mm -hmm. but the channel thing can be you know where do thoughts and ideas come from so that you know the channel thing can actually be amongst all of the the other book descriptions mm -hmm. the reasons for wanting to write them okay and so yeah. it, do you do you actively um sit down and decide what type of book am i going to write in your process because i know people are i mean you, I'm fascinated what you said earlier about the more you write, the more you write. Um, we'll come back yeah. to that definitely. But do you, do you do you sit down and go right? This book's going to be a commercial book. This book's going to be a vanity book. I mean, how, what's your process? I, I'd love to understand that. Right. Okay. Um, I think I look which type of book it is after mm. I've got the concept of the book. I'm oh. somebody that gets ideas, and you know, I. Um, I've always got the dictaphone by the side of me. Um, it's different with the phone now because you've always got a notepad on the phone or the dictaphone. You've always got something with you. Yes. But even if it's the middle of the night, you know, I'll get up, I'll go downstairs, I'll jot something down. If I get an idea for a book, the concept for a story. Yes. 
if I get a scenario yeah. that's just interesting, that if filled out, would make a fascinating story. So I build up this list of possible book titles. I've usually got titles that pretty much um, hint at the, the story or the content. Yes. And I've usually got two or three paragraphs. Yes. And um, with, um, with a story, I use, nearly always know where it starts and I know where it finishes. Right. Okay. And okay. then amongst in my folder of books on the laptop, the, the top 10 the ones that I'm likely to work on next, I number those and I shuffle the order from time to time. Some things might go up, some things might go down. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you're, I mean, this is really interesting because I'll need to get you to explain how many books you've written and on the topics in a minute. So it con gives it a context. But if you, do, do your, I guess it's like a, a river, the source of your stories, you know, it, it, is that serendipitous or is it from experience? You know, wh where does the kernel come, the, the seed, or does it just come to you, you know? Um, wh wh where does it start the very very start of it tony okay there's yeah there's probably a number of answers to that um I, I i'm quite interested in the goal setting um, i've got a business called mind and achievement and i um i've i've had big dreams and goals ever since i was young and for yeah. a long time they were quite elusive i could do really well in all kinds of areas of life but a certain area of goals i struggled with for a very long time mm -hmm. and i remember when i was about 13 14 asking questions of those around me how do i get how do i achieve it how do i get to where i want to be with a certain group of goals and i couldn't find anybody that could give me answers right which is why that when i found that audio book about goal setting because if you go back like 15 years ago it isn't it wasn't as well known um the audio uh books thing yeah. as it is today and if you go back to my childhood it was virtually non-existent back then mm -hmm. so i've always been quite driven by those answers that area of knowledge that we all should have that we all should have been taught yeah. that the information's there um and I, yeah i feel we all should have better access to that because so therefore all of the books that i write even when i write things about like the park the the carpenters pup group there's still stuff in there which is about setting your mind to achieve things there's still stuff in there about understanding goal setting and motivation and, and real life application yeah okay okay so for you um i mean this here's a picture of your 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 book about the carpenters um yeah. Were they a, a band that you liked before, or did you just become curious about? Obviously, the story is very interesting. What yeah, was the motivation? Um, well, when I was, um, I think it was about nine, the, the very first album I was ever given was for the ninth birthday, and it was the Carpenters, the singles, 69 to 73. Now, they did all kinds of amazing, you know, really good albums, but that, but that if I could only have one album, it'd have to be that one. Right. I mean, Karen's voice is just, um, it's an absolutely amazing voice. When um, there were people that could talk about that voice for hours yeah. on end. Yeah. When I wrote um, interviews with Carpenter's Tribute Tax, that there's full of so many um, aspects of her voice that, that these Tribute Tax were describing in every nuance and detail. So yes. both Richard and Karen Carpenter were two extremely talented people they were um they're geniuses so mm. any any amount of time either studying writing or listening or whatever about geniuses is certainly time well spent because they, <laughs> they, they 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 did they had some exceptional results yes. the, the album i was just talking about was um the best-selling album in the 70s at one point mm -hmm. yeah right yeah and to go back to where we started that conversation, because I'm trying to get into your into your psyche here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you, you, you get an idea um, yeah. that might be from a goal or for something else, yeah. and you said you then went 
keep me right, Tony, if I've got it wrong. But you then have an ending. You, you, you you've got. I'm, I'm assuming this is a, is this is this for your non-fiction and your fictional writing, or is it just for the fiction? Yeah, the, they um, yeah, the fiction because like the Carpenter's books were both in a sense they were quite um, practical. Yeah, because the the second book, the music survey, is obviously following a list of questions. So. so from a survey, so it obviously starts at one end and you follow it through to the other. Yes. The interviews with Carpenter Distribute Tax is a, a quite different kind of book. I, I once read a series of books um, called Stock Market Wizards right. um, by an American author. Absolutely fantastic books because when I was when I was um, struggling with my goals and stuff and I didn't have as much business knowledge, listening to these. Oh, reading these interviews with the stock market traders and things was surprisingly helpful. Right. And <laughs> it, it also had this parallel with personal development, which the author acknowledged, you know, and they, they were fascinating. So I always wanted to do an interview type mm -hmm. book. So that's, so like I say, you've, you end up with seven interviews. So you've got a, a start to the book saying what's, um, what the book's about. You've got seven interviews and then yeah. you draw the conclusion. Right. Okay. So, and yeah. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to say that on the Carpenters one, interestingly, mm -hmm. that I, I mentioned at the start, reasons to write a book. That was almost like the one that had that sort of channeled quality, because right. that was the one where I'd be just. I had no intention of writing any of the Carpenters books. I just wrote. I just kept getting so many ideas about that, the, the first one, The Carpenter's My Reflections. I just kept writing them down. You know, if it, it came to me in the middle of the night, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, I just write them down. I got so much stuff in the end. <laughs> I thought, well, you, you can't write it into a book. Yes. Um, so I just did that one. It was just a one-off. It was a little bit perhaps self-indulgent as far as I could see. I couldn't see how it fitted with my main area of work, the mind and achievement. Yeah. Um, but I did it, and then I'm lying on a beach um, a couple of years later, and I thought, hang on, we could do a bit more with this. We could... <laughs> and I liked the survey idea, and I liked the interview idea because it tied in with that stock market traders' books. And um, I, I had a bunch of other ideas, and some just made me laugh out loud. I thought, you can't do that. But there was... <laughs> the... Oh, well, see, one of the things is with the... Richard and Karen Carpenter, you've obviously got her anorexia thing, and yeah. there's a bit of a witch hunt going on. People are pointing, trying to put the blame. So none of my books have got any of that. It's all done to death, and, yeah. you know, they're, they're best placed people to write about such things. Oh. So I know there's a lot of interest in it. I know there's fans hungry for something else. So I just tried to bring something new to the party, which I think I did. All three books, very different, but yeah. strong common link. Yes, yeah. love it. So if I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get really anal here. Um, so yeah, yeah. you've got a start and an end. Yes. And this is probably more for your fiction rather than your yeah. your, your non-fiction. Yeah. Um, how how does one go about filling in the gaps? Because I mean, yeah. it's like, I mean, I, I, I've got ideas for books, uh, yeah. fiction, fiction books, uh, and I've written short stories and I've published some and I've published a book and, and you know, I've done all that. But I... I sit down sometimes and think yeah it's a good idea it's quite a good ending how am i going to fill the gap <laughs> you know the yeah. 300 words yeah. between the two how, how do you go about that right so well you um it helps i'm not not pointing at anybody but it helps if you've got a lot of life experience you know right. being basically done things sometimes not everybody can but they yeah. explore the world because they've read it in books yes um there's i think a good way to explain throw some light on what you're searching for is to explain the book that i'm writing next in my world travel book series okay and years ago we were on um holiday in ibiza and there was this uh, young lady um working on the door in the restaurant it was the first day on this job she would try to invite people in um, to get them to have a meal and things. And we just got talking to her and she was one of these sort of restless souls that would um, 
couldn't settle. She always had to be leaving the country. She always had to be working abroad. She always had to be, you know, not yeah. at home at a steady job, that kind of thing. Yes. And I was listening to, to her and I thought, you know, you're fascinating. You know, what's behind that? Is it a troubled soul? Is it a restless soul? Is it someone that just wants to see the world? Uh -huh. So I've got the next book I write in the Wild Travel book series is called um, The Ridgeway, which is Britain's oldest road. It's about 90 miles long. Me and the, my wife walked it about three years ago. What's it called and again? The Ridge? Is it the Ridge? The Ridgeway. Yeah, it starts off at um, Avebury Stone Circle, Europe's largest stone circle, passes oh. a load of chalk white horses, goes through woodland and all kinds of places. It's an amazing walk. So I always wanted to write a book on that. Right. So you've got the start of the book. I can quite see um, how that starts. I've got a girl working on a cruise ship. The cruise ship's coming into port and she's finishing her um tour of duty whatever she she was working on the entertainment there but so she should be going straight home to her parents but she stumbles across um one of the books the walking guide books for this walk so she decides right. she's going to walk the ridgeway and then go home so i've got an end point i can see how this is going to work and it will explain her character and there'll be a separate sort of other main character which will sort of tie in and by the time they get to the final chapter they will both have a better understanding of who they are and why they do certain things okay and i, I like to get quite a big finish on my stories so if they were i can imagine them if they were set to film oh look at that yeah i imagine if they were set to film what a big finish would look like so in the case of the ridgeway i've got a beginning and i've got an end but the walk itself is six days. So there's six oh, wow. chapters, different parts of the walk. Now, a walk might not be that interesting on its own, but you can add lots of characters that she meets each day. Yes. And as you go along, they're all sort of hinting and pointing to something that's going to happen farther on. Uh -huh. Do you, yeah. I mean, that, that you can guess what's come into my head. I've got the Wizard of Oz going through my head, you know, the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, characters and the yeah, uh, yeah. And, all, and i guess there's all the books about the camino de santiago you know the camino books as well that are yeah. um but that that sounds amazing i i love the fact that you i mean it sounds really simple but i assure you if you're watching this it's not to to actually come up with a structure uh because i know i've tried i did it once tony where i had a, a, a got a book deal and we were going to write this book and i had basically um it was one hundred and fifty thousand words and i wrote 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 and i didn't like it yeah right I, I didn't fall in love with my own book um and i think what the mistake i made it wasn't content was my problem it was probably and it sounds really weird but it was probably this what you've just said it's probably structure that was my problem not not the structure of story as such um which we couldn't yeah. come on to actually but more about the structure of the actual book itself you know i think that was my and, yeah. and to some that may seem simple but i didn't i didn't find it simple tony no see one of the things i like to do is, is to put lots of layers within it so you've got the you've got your main characters you've, you've got you've got the setting um which which the setting has a lot to do with helping to fill in the chapters so obviously on the walk you've got six um six different days yes um uh, what was the question again sorry <laughs> no, no, no. no i was just talking about structure yeah. really and about how yes. to yes. how to you know help people um who are watching today because i think it's right to say it would be daft if it wasn't the case everyone everyone everyone's experience of this is different you know, I don't think any two people are going to have the same experience of writing. Um, d d does that resonate with other authors that you yeah. speak to? Yeah. You see, there are like two types of writers. There are people that plan out the start and the yeah. end and, and sometimes every little bit along the way. And then there are those that um, sit down and write what, what comes to them each day, which right. is dangerous because you could 
it's a fine if it goes well but you could paint yourself into a corner quite easily yeah. you, you could walk into writer's block big time if you haven't got an overview right. um yeah you That's you need good. so if, if you've if you've got a beginning and end mm -hmm. you've got your main characters you've got a setting yeah. and then like i say i've got layers so there's always a goal setting thing i've got this this interest in ancient stone you know mankind's real history that's long lost we we don't know nothing about ourselves as, mm. as a species yes nothing at all. and it's it's good I, I try to write these books so they they lead you to ask questions or to think about some things in a different way which all adds layers of interest I, yes. I so for, I mean, one one of the I'll just show some of your books here. There's the the very ring that you wrote. Um, sorry, the resolution is not great on that photograph. But um, when when you start writing and you have your and you've really helpfully described that process, that's really good. Um, how do you decide about depth? So you you know if you read some writers, um, like the the chap who wrote The Martian recently, and 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 yeah who it writes in very fine detail and, and a lot of people don't like him because of that but many more like him because of that then you have at the, op at the other end of the scale someone like dan brown who's a bloody awful writer but a fantastic storyteller i mean it's really weird how the different styles how how do you do it how do you decide about if you're telling about a you know a white horse or about a character or about a walk how do you decide or does it just does it do you just let it flow how, how, how do you approach that yeah it's a good question it's um yeah i'm somebody that's got lots of ideas I'm, um you know i've got an interesting wide collective um range of things that i'm interested in so that i don't i don't, don't really i have a problem with the depth and the, the filling in the layers sort of thing and I, it yeah. seems to just come naturally to me to to, to do this interweaving thing because actually the the first four books in the well traveled book series if you read them and then go back to the first one you'll see there's so many pointers in the first book for stuff that's coming in the later ones right okay yeah okay so you you form connections between your books and your stories yeah there's, there's quite a bit of that going on you've got to be right. um You've got to be a bit careful with that because like i say you could paint yourself into a corner but like there's a well-traveled book series the first 10 books i pretty much know where it's going mm. yeah i mean that's the same as the stories isn't it the, the whole series i i've got an overview for it yeah right. it might move on well probably will move on to something different after 10. right um fresh ideas and fresh things how many books have you written tony uh i i've the two that I've just registered will take me to about 12. 12, my goodness. Yeah, there's two <laughs> two new ones coming out. Um, I'm going to do a few short stories because I'm... Oh, yeah. Right, okay. I'm a bit disillusioned with short stories because I, I imagine you'd think it would be easy to write an interesting short story and then you try and find a series of interesting short stories and you won't get very far till you're ready to chuck the book. <laughs> it, it oh. seems bizarre yeah right well, so yeah. i'm happy to have a go at trying to write some stories that you know have actually got something about them but right it's still short i'm gonna have a, a very quick break tony but yeah. when we come back I, I mean this is fascinating i'm really enjoying this um <laughs> I, i'd like to talk okay we could talk all day just about the form but let's talk about the process you know once you get to your first draft and publish it i think we'll get to that because we're already more than halfway through the show here way more than halfway through the show so let let me just have a quick break uh, and then we'll come back and i'll we'll see if we can get into that publishing thing tony with you a little bit because that to me ah, is really interesting isn't it everybody really interesting as always, I'd just like to take a quick break to remind you about some of the other activities that I'm involved in. And um, one of the, uh, the key projects that I'm working on at the moment is to try and bring some structure to what we've done over the last 38 weeks. Uh, I mean, this is getting towards the courses over a year now. Uh, we're starting to, at least I feel we're starting to make real progress with, you know, 
the, the challenges of structure, the challenges of, of actually sitting down and writing a story, thinking about a story, presenting a story, using fiction, using fact. I mean, the list, as you know, goes on. So at the end of the month, I'm, going, I'm running a one-hour uh, event uh, at the end of this month on storytelling where uh, I'm going to try to distill all the different themes that we've we, we've had on the show uh, into one hour. Now, it's going to be tough, um, but thanks for those of you who already bought tickets. Tickets are available on Funzing, and I will put that up uh, uh, before the end of the show for you to have a look at if you're interested in. But I hope you've enjoyed so far with Tony. I've really enjoyed it because um, he's a very practical guy, isn't he? Maybe it's his engineering. Tony, you're listening to this. Maybe it's because he's an engineer. Um, but it's very interesting that he's got that little structure. And even in half an hour, we're starting to see how this 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 rather prolific author creates his books. So, Tony, welcome back. Hello. Um, so let, let's talk about, okay, you've, you've written a book. Um, how many words make a book, incidentally? Is, it, is, there, a, is there a formula for that? <laughs> well, well yeah. they, the, the, the jury's always out on oh, no. that. They, yeah. they, when I first started writing, I was told you should be trying to write 70,000 plus. Um, I, interestingly, I heard somebody say recently, because the way our habits have changed because of the internet, writing smaller, less words is probably better because people don't have the time to, well, they, they're just used to, you know, going on YouTube, two minute videos here, two minute videos there. So the mindset's a bit different. Yes, I I do. I think it stands to reason that the shorter you write the book, the better the chances of being read in full. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 So, depending on what you're aiming the book at, who you want to talk to and get the message across, if you're trying to share something with some somebody that an audience that you know are busy people, you don't want to be doing a six volume book series. You want to be short tight and concise yes it's interesting because yeah. I, I i spoke to a, a a filmmaker about this yeah. and what he said was uh something similar to what you've just said that back in the 70s and the 80s when you didn't have you know access to you know films online as we have now stories on audio books as we have now he said the writing style had to be very different because people couldn't miss an episode because if they did, they lost the story. Yeah. But now when they write, and he's talking about screenwriters, um, which are obviously a similar but slightly different species of writer to a, a, a writer of books, the, the story arcs can be more complex because people can binge watch. They can always go back now. Because you know yourself, if you missed an episode of something back in the 80s, you couldn't. You had to wait a year and a half to come back on the television or you had to get... Hopefully, one of your friends had recorded it on one of his old clunky videotapes, you know. Yeah. So there yeah. must be. I think that that that's a really interesting some, something to really think about. I might come back to that in a future show, actually. Yeah. But just I, before, I, I, yeah. I think just to add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my wife's always watched Coronation Street, mm. and to be absolutely fair to that show, you can um, you can miss a bunch of episodes. And you sit down to watch one and you get back into it. Yeah. And like like you've just said, that's not possible with so many things. No, no. It's uh, interesting. And it was also interesting what you've said about um older films, older stories. Yeah, now, I think the same's um true with books. It's a, you should never sort of forget the past. It's always worth revisiting some of the older books and films. And mm. the best of them will stand the test of time. Mm. It's interesting with older books, you get some, and as old as they are, the language is as clear and accessible today um, as it was years back. And you get some others, and they're only decades old, and they're really hard work right over your head. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that that could be a subject of a whole other, whole other episode, because <laughs> uh, one, one of the things yeah. that I... I um... I get frustrated by uh, mainly in in science um, is how poor the, the writing is. You know the the standard of the writing does go over people's heads because the yeah. they, they they have a some, for some reason it's it's maybe a, a form of armor or something, but they, they think they need to write a certain way because they are a certain type of person, yeah. and you don't need to do that. You just need to make it relatable and understandable, and uh, and then you'll get a bigger audience. But yeah. Oh, it's a big subject. I've got a couple of comments here. I'd just like to take before we talk about your 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 next yeah. step, if yeah. that's okay. Uh, Joe Joe's saying uh, 
when Karen Carpenter sings, she sounds like she's singing directly to you. Yeah. An amazing voice, immortal. Well, I don't think you'll disagree with that, will you, Tony? No, no. Uh, she's a. Uh, it, it's interesting because I, I run a music uh, live show on a Friday night about a venue in, in Scotland called the Glasgow Apollo. And a lot of the guys that are on there are, you know, old punks and rockers and mods and, you know, new romantics. But nearly all of them like the Carpenters. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's odd because, I mean, you, you wouldn't have thought it, but they do. Um, mm. and, and a lot of them are, are musicians, and obviously she was a good singer, but she's actually a very good drummer as well, wasn't she? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I like a, a wide range of yeah. music. You know, I, and I love the classical music. Um, yeah. um, some of that stuff is just, you know, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, but like for me, over, over time, the, it, the Carpenters have been like a a constant, um, yeah. like a constant for me, sort of all the way. And I can, I could, you know, I could go back to any album played at any time and listen happily to it. Uh, yeah. So, so much um, of the musical talent out there, you can only listen to it for a time. And then you need a break from it. You need something else. But the carpenters yeah. are always, it's just good music. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Go on, going, back, going back yeah. to her voice and the comment somebody yeah. just said, she also had this amazing skill that you can play her music and it feels like she's singing just to you. It feels yeah. like she stood in the room with you. Yeah. You know, so talented. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There's another comment here. I'll read it to you rather than put it on the screen because it's quite a yeah. long one. It's from Doug. It says, Hi, yeah. Scott and Tony. I love writing and have loads of ideas, but always have something else more pressing to do. Oh. <laughs> does storytelling necessarily need sacrifice of other parts of your life? And does it make for a better, more passionate story? Or are some people just born story smiths who can juggle all of life's challenges while throwing out stories? Whoa. I think there could be a whole a whole episode of that one as well, Tony. What do you think of that from Doug? Yeah. Well, there's so it sounds like he's got the ideas, but he's struggling to find the time to do it. Yeah. Right. So the best thing to do when it's like that is you just give yourself half an hour each day at a certain point in time. <clears throat> It's probably mornings to like get up half an hour earlier. If right. you are really short of time, you need to be reading some books about writing faster. Right. The fastest way to write, um, something I'm beginning to experiment with, but I haven't done that much of it, is to audio dictate, which is something that's getting increasingly easier now as technology yes. advances. For argument's sake, you can record an audio file into your dictaphone. You can go on one of the file translation sites and have it put into a Word document, and then you just add your full stops and commas. Yeah. Or with your phone nowadays, usually in the notepad or the Word item or on Word itself, there's a speaker. Yeah. So you press that, you can audio dictate, and you will do more words per minute. As so long as the ideas are ready to put out yeah. there onto paper, then yes. in short half hour bursts, day after day, you could be surprised what you could put together. Mm, that's lovely advice. Um, yeah. Thank you. Doug, I look forward to seeing your book. Uh, Tony and I would yeah. like to come to the book launch, please. Um, yeah. yeah. So you've written the first draft. Yeah. Um, and it's time to think about, you know, getting this thing, you know, bringing it to reality, bringing it into being, you know. What do you do next? What do you, how do you take it to that next stage, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, go back a bit. It was interesting what you said about you wrote this book and you didn't like it. Yeah. Um, I I haven't had that yet, but I I imagine it must be a bit awkward. Or, or um, so I've certainly I usually like what I'm writing because they come from my experience and knowledge and ideas and things. And usually, you should sort of get a flow. And then you you feel really happy and you know when you've got a good one um certainly like white horses live forever and the many lovers of henry farmer which isn't quite as the title suggests both yeah. of those books i you know i'd almost got a smile on my face as i was writing them you know i was enjoying it so much yeah and i because i just knew the content within it was um smack on and really engaging so yeah i think it's important to um listen to that vibe within you 
And yeah. if I suppose if you really didn't like a book, I think you'd probably have to think how far you take it. Yes. But at the same time, if you didn't like it, I think you should still complete it. There's a lot to be said, but whatever the size of the book, you start yeah. a project and you finish it. Yeah. I think what, what I did, Tony, was I set out to write a, a, a book of, you know, helpful stories, if you like, in, in, a, in the business world. Yeah. But, but I ended up writing a, an academic book. I kept, as you said earlier, I kept backing myself into corners because I, yeah. I, I would, um, and this is probably because of my scientific training, because I, I would look at like, I was doing basically um, end to end of, a, of the, the life cycle of a human being at work. So I would look at things like, you know, job description, where did that start? So I went and researched that. So it started with a Scottish engineer in America building railroads during the the, the great western uh, you know atrocities when the europeans were killing all the indians got interested in that then i found out there was a guy and i kept going yeah so i needed to have some sort of stop button you know i just couldn't stop myself and then when i put it all together there was 150,000 words and mm. it, it was just awful because it was just there, there wasn't a thread well there was a thread along the top but each of them went too deep you know, it just went too deep, and I wouldn't have read it. You know, I wouldn't have read it. So, it was a wee challenge, I have to say. Um, publisher wasn't very happy, but I, I, I didn't want it. Right. I didn't want it published. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want it published. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, so how do you go then? So you've come to the end of of the writing process, at least the first draft. What's next? Yeah. What's next yeah, for you? Yeah. How so you yeah, you 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 do your first draft, and yeah. you you should be happy with it to the point of quite liking it or being really excited about it and yeah. i don't th i think if if you're not feeling like that then you haven't finished your first draft you've got to go back and <laughs> okay. edit in or out whatever's causing you to feel not right about it Good it's interesting the um the singer alanis morissette yeah, I'm going to one of her concerts later in the year if they ever stop moving the date. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to COVID. Um, I heard her in an interview, and she's a very clever, well read woman. And she's been writing a book, I believe. I once heard her say in an interview. So she wrote down all kinds of things. I, I forget what the word count, but it was massive. It, it clearly wasn't one book, it was two, if not three. And, and it sounded like it was, it was so really eclectic a chapter on this a chapter on that and it, it was all so diverse and that's clearly a book that um as much as you like it it needs it needs splitting up it yeah. needs breaking down it's not it didn't sound like one book it sounded like something that's there's a number of books in there on certain subjects it needed splitting so i think it is possible to write something and you get to the end of the first draft and it, it isn't it can be um not as envis not as envisaged and certainly with characters they can do that because you you start writing the character and characters develop because that's that channeling thing you know where do ideas come from yes and you could get to the end of the book and and something's different mm. uh, it could be you there's a minor character and you look at that minor character and that's a spin-off book because there's so much in it there's, that character's got certain qualities Mm. They're, they're, or they're stealing the show for some reason. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we off really... topics? Like you know, no question still. Or... No, no, no. It's, this is fast. I'm loving this. Uh, okay. So let's get get back to the question again. How okay. how do you go from that final draft to having it in, in you know available on Amazon? Yeah. How... Um, yeah. So you get to the final draft. Yeah. It, yes. It should. The final draft should match your original objectives you yeah. should be a, you should have an understanding of, of the reason you wrote it in my case commercial stroke informative book with a little bit of channeling going on perhaps um when you're happy with it then you should always get professional proofreading no matter who you are mm -hmm. you should always get professional proofreading not just you know um typos and that stuff but people's fresh pair of eyes spot things spot connections that you've missed or whatever so 
that yeah. should always be be done some professional editing and then yeah and then um read through it yourself after mm -hmm. it's stood for a couple of weeks you know get get it all completed get it wrapped up put take the mistakes out or errors put it put it on the shelf for a couple of weeks then come back to it and read it again with a fresh pair of eyes if there's something you need to tweak a bit more you do it at that point right. and then that it's time to get it published mm -hmm. yeah and how and how do you go about, about that how do you do it well in in my case i'm a amazon kdp author that's the platform i use right um yeah other people might be an established publishing house but i'm happy with amazon it's the biggest publisher in the world and kindle's the second biggest publisher yes so yeah so the, the process is fair yeah you yeah once you've got the final copy and then you need to get the yeah final draft all all edited and all the rest of it yes. then it needs to be typeset so it all looks professional nice layout and stuff yes um oh a tip uh, yeah a big tip here is all always start writing on the size document that the final book's going to be right <laughs> yeah because it makes the editing simpler because you can't help but edit a little bit as you go along it, there's no way to avoid it but obviously if, if you if you do it on a piece of a on an a4 document and you, that looks really nice as soon as you put it into the book size that you actually want it all changes yes. so yeah so you should always write it in the right size document to begin right. with okay yeah um and yeah and then it's it's basically uh, when it's ready to publish you put it into a pdf and upload it to amazon is it easy as that on amazon is it amazon is yeah yeah right okay yeah the, the, well you know it's, it's the old learning curve the first one's the hardest yes um, but once you yeah once you've done it it's quite easy and yeah. um there's so many educational videos on um youtube about how to do it if someone was struggling but yes there, there isn't really a, a problem as long as you got the the um the formatting right yes. and it's a right size document mm -hmm. and you've got the professionally made book cover to the, the same size as well yes yeah right. okay yeah. and how do you how do you go about selecting the artwork because obviously if it's online if it's a digital copy that i'm assuming i might be wrong uh but i'm assuming the artwork must be really important yes um yeah yeah it, artwork is uh it's crucial to a mm. to a good book cover mm -hmm. but interestingly i heard uh arthur reese so i heard an author recently say he yeah. had he was um done this absolutely fantastic um professional image on the cover full yeah. of detail and stuff like that mm -hmm. but when he started advertising the book online it didn't work right because yeah. when you were if you were selling from a basically a thumbnail size you need something that stands out and small detail isn't going to work right right um yeah. So you you need to think about book size. Yeah, you've got the book in your hand. That's wonderful. You can see everything. When you're starting to sell digitally online, and people are looking, I mean, a, a laptop's not so bad, but if they're looking on a phone or mm. something like that, or it's something off on an email, yes, then they are seeing something much smaller and less detailed. Mm. So book covers need that they are what sells your book but you do have to think in in size as well how would this look if it was really small would exactly. it still speak to me right and do yeah. you find do you find then i mean and my final question i see the time sorry um but do you find that most of your readers buy the book or do they use kindle or what what's the, the you know what's yeah. the most do you know do you know what's more popular it's 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 a, even across the two is it um, i i had like a lot of authors i had some reluctance about kindle um to start with because mm -hmm. my, my first carpenter's book um that was out there on kindle but the other two um the music survey one um that's not because the, the formatting is much more challenging if you have a thumb through the book you can 
you soon see why. But I think I'm going to have to um, find a way to get that done. The yeah, I th- yeah, my my feeling and understanding of Kindle is it greatly changed, and I'm reading more on Kindle myself, which I suppose helps yes. my change the opinion of it but yeah right. i think both they sell equally well in both camps The what you do the advantage you do get with the kindle is you can discount the book to 99 cents or yeah pounds, whatever and you can really promote it where a paperback book is always going to have a limit to how far you can bring it down plus they're going to oh, pay yeah. the postage yes so if you really want to make a big hit and a big splash, you've got to have a really juicy Kindle book that you can wave in front of people. Look at this, 99p. You've got yeah. this small thumbnail that looks fantastic, and it's got this great title, and you're really going to want to read it. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can do things with Kindle that you cannot do with published traditional books. Right. I mean, it's, it's true in both camps, isn't it? But the Kindle especially the way the world's gone now where um it's all about online you know the, the days of sitting at the book signing to promote your books have gone yes so the world's a very different place mm-hmm. yeah. yeah have you yeah. ever uh, had any of your books uh, done as audiobooks given where you started it would be a nice <laughs> closing yeah. circle, it, isn't it? yes i i that's been suggested to me on a number of times yes um it's coming i think yeah right. Who, who, if you had infinite money and all the rest of it and time, who would you like? I like your own voice, actually. But anyway, excluding <laughs> you, uh, who would be the person you'd want to read your books? Who, who, who would be the, the actor that you'd uh, love to hear? Well, um, they, if it was a Carpenter's book, it would have to be an American yeah. actor or actress, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because um, the content is the Carpenters, but everybody's talking about Karen, it would probably have to be a female American right, voice. Okay. The okay. Well Travel book series are all set down in Wiltshire and Bath in Somerset and the surrounding area. So yeah. you would need an English voice. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. But the Scottish voice is an extremely good voice. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent yeah. public speakers in, in, in the Scottish <laughs> accent. <laughs> well, listen, Tony, that, that has been really, really fascinating. I think you could probably write a very interesting book about the writing process, Tony. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. that, that was in an hour. We've really packed in quite a bit there, haven't we? Because we've gone from yeah. where do the ideas come from? How do you structure a book? How do you then get the book to the point where you're happy with it? How do you then get it pub- You know, it, you've done the... That we haven't talked about marketing, but that's about the only thing we haven't really spoken about, apart from a little bit about thumbnails. But if there was anywhere that people could have a look at your work or could contact you, where, where would the where would the best place be? Um, I've got a website, um, tennybrassington.com. They can find me on Amazon, uh-huh. and I could ah, it's just come up there. Yeah, and I can share this link with you for the Well Travel book series. All oh, right, okay. If you file that over to me, I can put it up for for people. That will show that. Right, put that up. Hold on. Slightly fiddly on on the system here, but I've managed to do it. There you go. Okay, so that that'll appear on the the YouTube channel and everybody else, Tony. So people can but can. The, the advantage is with a surname like Brassington, there aren't that many of us, so um, <laughs> you should be able to track me down. Yes, well, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Um, it's been really nice to reacquaint ourselves together as well, because I know we we had it was quite stressful at the TEDx experience, but we did get to chat, but not, probably not enough. But uh, I would urge people if they haven't seen uh, Tony's TEDx to have a look there on on you. What was the title of it again? Can you remind me what the title was? Come on, oh, I don't know. It's um, something to do with Easter Island lessons from Easter Island. That, that's right. Yeah, and I mean, it, it really. I mean, and as you see in the picture, you looked very, very sophisticated and suave that day. So, yeah. um, <laughs> by all means, have, have, have a have a look at Tony's uh, TEDx. Tony, yeah. thank you very, very much for appearing on Artifact Live. I do, yeah. I do really appreciate, yeah. it and it was great to talk to you, mate. Thank yeah, you. It's been great to do. It. Cheers now. Bye bye. Bye bye. So I hope you you enjoyed that as much as I did. You probably have a big smile on my face. Um, it, it, it was fascinating to hear a a, a job in writer, some a real storyteller who's doing it in the written format, 
telling us about and sharing with us his process. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, I hope if you if you get a chance, if you enjoyed this, share it and make sure people who are maybe aspiring writers or blocked writers get Tony's wisdom because there was there was a lot packed in there, wasn't there? There was a lot packed in there. So a couple of things before we finish. Why do I bother doing this show? Why do I bother with it? Well, I've said this, uh, every time I say this, people go, that's a good idea. Well, I believe that, that a good story or a good book in, in Tony's ex a case can act as an empathy engine. It can really help us understand other people. It can really help us understand other perspectives, people who are other to us. And it's all over the media just now, isn't it, about all these different groups and how we're all arguing with each other and we're all forming, I think, more and more cliques. I think stories are a way, are an anecdote to that. So not only are they an empathy engine, they're also an anecdote to that. But I think Tony epitomised this a bit like what happened last week with Ewan, that gathering your own stories is really important. And I genuinely believe that stories can change the world. So I really hope that you enjoyed this week's show. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I felt it was uh, a, you know, instructional as well as funny and fun. So thanks again, Tony. That was fantastic. So thanks for tuning in to Artifact Live, where we study the art and science of storytelling. My name is Scott MacArthur, and I'll see you next week at the same time. Thanks for tuning in.